Hello, everybody. Um, sorry for starting late. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if everybody, anybody's there still. Veronica, are you there? I am, yes, I, although I cannot see the screen, but I can talk through if the screen's there for other people. Are other people there? Okay. I got a Rick. response from Nadia. Greg, would you like? Anyway. To... Oh, that's wonderful. Greg, would you like to run with it? Uh, yeah, I just need to figure out how to share my screen. Good. So if you don't mind just hanging on and then I'll try and figure out how to do that. If you share the screen, I can talk through it. If you can, if, if people can hear me, that's great. Just tell me when I should go. Okay, I think everybody can see the digital for health professionals learning screen. Um, right. I'll pick on Nadia and I'll ask if she can let us know. Good. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm really sorry about the time delay. Um, we were not aware of the difference in summer summer timing, but here we are, and we're really excited to be part of this webinar series. And um, this initial photo was one that Sally partly used um, from one of my sessions with students. We're actually a student, we were busy on a Google Doc with the students sharing um, what they knew about obstetrics, and a student then came to talk about his own experience. And that's why all the heads are up, but really a lovely example of students working together. So we get, um, this afternoon we get, we've got a few different parts to our session. I'll be talking with this Adobe Spark um, presentation, which is a little different to the usual PowerPoints um, and is, is fun to use. Then Greg will follow up with some tools that he's, um, for, he'd like to talk about and the importances of technology in our teaching and learning. And then we will um, share with you a video recording that we um, took yesterday of us discussing um, aspects of technology with teaching and learning. And I really um, would, if there are any questions, Greg will answer them in between. But I really encourage engagement through our discussion. Okay, so Greg and I are both from the UCT, the Department of Health Sciences Education. And we started working together when we um, were promote, began promoting open educational resources, which is a movement of free resources worldwide um, to say that knowledge is a public good and it should be avail available for everyone, not just those who can afford textbooks. And it's been quite an exciting journey. But one of the um, limitations of OER being spread out is that um, educators, it's something different for educators, and it will take time to really make a difference. Um, we, we, in this changing world with technology bringing so many differences and challenges to traditional teaching and learning, and one of the aspects is that we all learners. Traditional teaching has been very linear and contained with teachers coming with structured curricula and teaching students and then assessing them. And what's happening now in the information age is that we're having topics and the knowledge is being spread out and is multi-directional rather than unidirectional, often with students bringing the knowledge into the classroom and engaging with each other, as in my initial um, photograph. 
And um, the French philosophers, Deleuze and Guattari, um, talk about rhizomes and rhizomatic learning, rhizomatic research, which I found very useful, where one really starts in the middle and spreads out through connections. So, for instance, you introduce a topic in a classroom, and then students bring their own um, knowledge on that topic, and then more topics emerge. So it's really an expanding way of teach, expansive way of teaching. Um, very different to before, as I said, and a shift to openness, and in many ways uncertainty as well. Um, Deleuze and Guattari talk about a tree-like approach of a recent changing to rhizomes. When you think of a bulb of gar a, a gar bulb of garlic, that is what a rhizome looks that the kind of rhizome they're referring to starting in the middle and spreading out. So where are we as educators in this changing world? Um, Sally, Sally Parsley spoke about skills and competency and asking how we can thrive in digital so societies. And what about our capabilities in terms of digital literacy? And then also what about the tools? Um, in the first webinar, Jean, um, the two students spoke about the sort of tools they use, like WhatsApp, LinkedIn, and their past experiences with one student from Mexico saying how familiar he was with technology, and Matthew from Cameroon saying how it was new to him, but how he had engaged with it and how found it so helpful. So there are many different ways people engage, and much of it is related to access, but there's more than access in technology in, um, when we're thinking about technology. So Greg and I were discussing um, what would be the, how would we approach this with um, you as the listeners, and we thought first, where, does, where do educators begin? They often ask, why should we go electronic? Why should we go e into e-learning? And many, many of the answers are, we're in the digital age. We, it can give us access to resources, which makes it simpler for us and simpler for students. It's efficient and saves time. Everything's right there online. And we can record student activity. We've got, we get data. We can capture, we can capture patterns and analyze them, which are all very relevant, but there's so much more to introducing technology into our educational arenas. And that's why I put and, 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 looking at what are the potentials and possibilities that we can explore. But there is a warning. We need to ask ourselves, is technology actually adding value to our pedagogical practices or just changing the way we do things? That we're doing the same practices but just really putting them onto an electronic format? Um, and, or, and is technology just being an add-on or are we really integrating it into our practices? And we talk about digital citizenship. And Greg and I decided that the three C's would be the most helpful because they really stand out for us. The, C, three, the C's of connections, collaborations, and creativity. And certainly in the web, webinars that have gone before us in the series, collaboration came up from everyone um, that will be following through. So we started off with connections, and we're looking at connections with content, with the educator and the students, and with others in peer groups and beyond. So here, is an here are examples in illustrations um, drawn for us by Stacey Stent, um, showing how an image, a PDF, a reading, from students can be um, worked on together, can be then connected to students in other very different places, 
where they can talk about it together, refer to it. They can be sitting anywhere, even Table Mountain. That's um, the mountain that overlooks us here in Cape Town. Sit at the top of Table Mountain overlooking our beautiful Table Bay and work on their texts or even at the beach. And we've got some beautiful sandy beaches here in Cape Town. And that's, that's okay. That's, that's absolutely okay. If a student feels comfortable and um, is able to learn better in different places, why not? So really technology is allowing us to promote learning in different times, places, and directions. And then using cloud computing, students, can, students and educators can work together on a document synchronously, um, like we do in Google Drive, or asynchronously. So I think it was Dr. Eduardo Mayorga was talking about um, people on his ophthalmic educators course finding 4 a.m. as a good time to work. And that work, that is absolutely fine. One can, while other people want to work midday. And that this technology allows us to do that. And we're also able to use an expanded amount of resources. It doesn't, our learning and teaching doesn't, um, isn't only, um, the responsibility of the educator because students can bring resources that they find in different places and they can often be very very useful and even more relevant than what the teacher brings because often students have different um, resources for finding um, information and then we're looking at tools and Greg will expand on this aspect what are the affordances what do different tools bring for us and we need to ask what is most appropriate for the student needs and for our learning outcomes. So, for instance, blogging is a very useful tool and used widely, particularly in health um, professional education. But it can be used just as a tool for reflection for students, um, for their own personal reflective process. It can be used in a group on the learning management system at UCT, we have Vula. Or like Michael Rowe, a physio, physiotherapist at the University of Western Cape did, he, he got students to blog and to tweet their ethics course on the World Wide Web. And so he got input from people all over the world and the students were able to engage with people way beyond their university which was challenging and also very helpful in many ways, developing um, new networks. Are there, are there any questions at this stage? No questions in the, in the chat room, Salong. So Veronica. Okay. Great, thank you. I'll carry on then. We've got, we're going to be talking about collaboration and then creativity. So collaboration is a key component of health education and um, it's being increasingly appreciated, um, whether in terms of a community of practice, whether it's a group of educators. Um, Professor Judith McKenzie spoke about collaboration in the MOOC that she developed. And it's, it's really technology can enhance collaboration. And we're realizing the value of so many alternative pathways. So here's a, an image showing um, students looking at their screens and many of the different tools that are used for collaboration, like Facebook, um, Creative Commons licenses that are part of the OER movement, allowing others to use resources and work with them together. And so collaboration can happen between students in pedagogical spaces and also in different ways. Ronald um, Harden um, from Amy has um, has written in his book about collaboration between different disciplines within a medical school. 
between the different phases, undergraduate, postgraduate, and continuing education, and the different healthcare professions, which are, which are where there is a history of silo learning and teaching. And now, through technology, we're able to collaborate and share our resources, share our information, and really work better together. Here is a screenshot that I took of Dr. Eduardo Mayorga's um, webinar which, when he was giving it to us um, recently, showing the tools that he uses in his online course. And then um, creativity. Learning ought to be fun. Students ought to feel motivated. But there's a, re and there's a real need for our pedagogical approaches to change, to be more open and enable creativity. And what are we bringing to the classroom that the students can't find for themselves? And this is very challenging for many educators. And smart boards are a way of providing a space for students to play around with their ideas and share them together. Also, to be able to record what's come through to the classroom. Here's a lovely example of students learning together creatively. But um, digital storytelling is being used more and more, where the students are able to express their stories record them and then share them and really what is what is growing is this movement to um, allow to encourage students to create their own content for learning so valuing students experiences valuing students knowledge and their expertise online and saying what can you create of relevance to this course and let's share it so we're really looking at a, a motivating students with a desire for learning and to open up these new potentials that weren't there before. Uh, a, a small example from obstetrics is one of where one of the educators started a Facebook site called Gyne Girl and how the students shared their learning and creativity in that space. And then Michael Rowe, who I mentioned earlier, does a lot of um, blogging, and he refers to a, a study of, on Snapchat um, where he says, why were so few questions asked about, but, relative, but there were so few questions asked about why students are still in the classroom. And he also notes, we're spending a lot of time looking at technology that may improve superficial aspects of pedagogical work, but we spend very little time on anything that would fundamentally change the underlying infrastructure. So many people are just posting resources online and getting students to post their assignments online, posting exam results online, but yet that's not under that's not changing the underlying pedagogical approach, which is so necessary. So I really thank you for this time and I welcome any questions and I'll pass the microphone on to Greg to um, follow through. Thank you. Before I go on, Veronica, there are two questions. Um, one was uh, about experiences of personalization in year learning. And the other one was about the use of open repositories for collaboration. Um, have you got any experience with either of those two? I think you more experienced and more of an expert on those two topics, Greg. Um, personalization in e-learning is something that has been has been spoken about, personal learning networks. And I think to, to a certain degree, there are only a few people that have really uh, put effort in trying to include this in their in their teaching, um, in making sure that the environment that the, the students uh, or the environment the students are in uh, are not just the one size fit all. So at UCT, I know that there are one or two people that have done it, but but not many. Um, in terms of open repositories, um, I think what what is become more and more to the fore are the amount of 
of material in open um, as open educational resources that are actually useful from from a teacher point of view. And, and, and what I mean with that is that um, a lot of the time teachers or educators will create content first um, and then go and look and see if there's anything out there. But there's definitely been a mindset change where educators now are first looking to see what's available on OER because the amount of OER has grown so much, uh, especially the ones that are applicable to them. So I hope that answers your, your question, Daksha. Um, what I also I, want to share about, sorry? I um, was just thinking about um, Judith McKenzie's comments that um, the University of Johannesburg are using part of her MOOC, which is presumably an OER, for their resource for their students. And I found that very interesting. While um, she said it didn't really fit in with her course, so it, it was a very different way of then working with the, with the MOOC, either as a, in a closed way or an open way. OK. OK, do you, do you, do you see the PowerPoint? OK, I think it's there now. So what I want to talk about briefly is just some of the more practical aspects of, of going digital um, and alluding to some of the things that Veronica has spoken about already. Uh, a big thing in learning technologies is affordances. Um, what does the technology afford? Um, not just in terms of explicitly, but also how different people use it. Uh, for example, if you look at a, a spoon, the, what, it, what it allows or its functionality is mostly for eating, but it also affords you to use the same spoon as a digging tool. So it's not something that it allows. Um, just and the pedagogies in terms of how it's being used. And basically, um, using the technology to suit a pedagogy, uh, to select the pedagogy to facilitate the desired outcome. So first looking at what you want and then choosing the tool that will, will allow you to do exactly that. So if we're looking at connectivity, uh, something that in Africa, it's a big thing is access, um, not just in terms of um, able to access the internet, uh, but also in terms of a device to be able to access the internet. Um, a, a discussion or talk I was at yesterday spoke about the, uh, a new um, initiative in the faculty to try and get laptops for those students who don't have any, any of them. And at the moment they've got about six students identified in one particular year who don't have laptops. So now we're trying to, to to collect old laptops to be able to give to those students. Um, data availability, uh, the cost in South Africa is, is a big thing, um, even though they will often tell us that our data cost is not the highest in the world. Um, in terms of uh, exposure to, to information and technology and whether we should allow the bring your own device. And like I said already, we can't really use that as an approach because we're not sure that everybody will be able to bring a device. So if we look at social media, uh, this is an abstract or an extract from uh, the top 200 tools used um, for e-learning in 2017. And out of the top 200, Twitter was number five. So that is the tool that according to the survey is, the use, is used most in, in social media for, for learning. Um, LinkedIn is big, bigger than Facebook and after the Hashtag delete Facebook last last week. It probably has dropped a few places. Uh, and Instagram is is very big among the the youth or the younger generation. In terms of um, collaboration, I mean most of these you already know. There are lots of tools that allow that. Uh, the webinar tool that we're using at the moment, Dropbox, Adobe Connect, Skype. Uh, they're probably most people use for uh, video conferencing and Google Drive. Uh, all of those are tools that allows you to collaborate with one another without having to be in the same place. 
in terms of collaboration, again, uh, MOOCs, uh, in terms of, uh, in fact, I think that should be discussion. So in terms of discussions, uh, there are lots of discussions that happens on MOOCs um, because you're reaching uh, a far wider audience than you would have done uh, a few years ago. Google Hangouts, Twitter, WhatsApp, um, a great device, mobile device, doesn't take a lot of the data and can connect almost anybody anywhere, uh, and Snapchat. One of the things that we're looking at as well is uh, where does creativity comes in, as Veronica spoke about already, and how you, would you allow creativity? And those are just drawings that were done on, on, a, on an iPad, or can be done in a, or any tablet, and she spoke as, for us well about just doing it on a, on a whiteboard, allowing students to be, giving them space to be creative, uh, annotating and working with PDFs on the beach or wherever else that, that may be. Um, this might be a useful wheel uh, or diagram to look at uh, again. Um, there's so many tools out there and what this tool allows you to do is to have a look at what are the tools that allow you to, uh, according to the Bloom's taxonomy, to, to focus on creation, to focus on evaluation or application. Um, it's overwhelming, to be honest. Um, and a lot of those tools, I don't even know what they stand for. Uh, but at least it gives you a starting point. And to keep in mind that some of those tools are at, on different, different uh, sectors of that same wheel. Um, I spoke about the top 200 tools for learning earlier on, uh, and I will send the link as well. And number one is YouTube, the same as it was in 2016, and Google Search, the same as it was in 2016. Uh, PowerPoint, as much as death by PowerPoint gets thrown away, thrown around a lot, PowerPoint is still one of the, is still the top three in terms of the uh, learning tool that's being used. Um, Google Drive, Twitter is there's number five. So, and most of us use those tools. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, thank you for listening to, to Veronica and I. Um, if you want to contact us for more information, those are email addresses. And we will also make the, uh, the Adobe Spark and the PowerPoint, and in fact, the video that, that Veronica spoke about early on, we'll make that available. Um, thank you. I'm just looking at, at some of the questions. Um, Nadia has raised the aspect around the negative aspects of social media. Um, Veronica, would you like to talk about that? Um, I think it's, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Right. I think it's very important that students are introduced to the value and the benefits and the detrimental aspects of social media as early as possible, preferably in school, but I feel it's a really important aspect of professional med um, education that um, they um, are fully aware of the permanence of what they write on social media and the impact. And I think at the moment in South Africa, the, um, the issue of a, uh, an estate agent giving a racist comment and now being um, sentenced to two years imprisonment really is astounding. And um, we, we need to help students be aware of the importance of what goes on social media and what doesn't and the, the, really the permanence of it and also the ethical aspects. Ethics seeps through in every way um, in all our communications and particularly online because of, its, because of its permanence and because of its energy and ability to spread. But there's also lots of positive aspects about social media. And Nadia's raised that point that a friend of hers has started a journal club on Twitter, which now has a worldwide audience, uh, right. which is true. Absolutely. So I, I actually have a Facebook account for work and one for home. And my work one is a huge resource for um, being connected to in, uh, educational information, articles, and how wonderful to have a journal club. Um, that sounds amazing. Because one of the one of, I've noticed the local journal club really struggles to have people come 
and join um, with each other. And part of it is the traffic, the time issue. So to have it online, how wonderful. So Nadia, you definitely have to share that with us, uh, the Twitter account of your friend, so that we can go and have a look at this online journal club, please. <laughs> Um, I think our time is up. We started late, so but we still need to finish on time. Um, any last word, Veronica? Thank you very much, and um, thank you for the series. I think it's very exciting, and I hope there'll be more of them. So thank you. Um, oh wow. Okay, you got two more questions, Veronica. Uh huh. How useful do you think the universal design for learning educational framework to help us to design inclusive e-learning that suits the learning and the learning outcome? Is it used at UCT? Universal design for learning? Greg, do you have um, experience of that? Um, in fact, our disability studies unit is probably the the one department that is looking at at this to a certain degree um, because at UCT I must admit we we don't design for inclusivity uh, and they but they are the ones who have brought this up a few times uh, in terms of just even making our web content accessible um, which is very easy to do but most of the time we don't think about doing it so it hasn't taken off to a large degree in, in Cape Town yet, but it has started. Uh, that's all I can say, Sally. Uh, and Nadia has shared the, the link to, to the online Twitter or the online journal club. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you, Nadia. That's wonderful. Then thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to Sally um, and Daksha for organizing the, these webinars. Uh, they have been great. And uh, again, our apologies for getting the time zone wrong. Uh, we, we, we worked on a different time down here in South Africa. And in this case, it was not about African time. <laughs>